Hello, and welcome to the Sci-Fi Christian Book Reviews brought to you by the Sci-Fi Christian.com. I am Ben DiBono. And talking to you today about another reread that I just finished. Actually, a re-listen to. I, I uh, re-listened, well, listened for the first time, uh, but my second read-through, Werner Vinge's Zones of Thought duology, A Fire Upon the Deep and A Deepness in the Sky. And yes, I am aware there is a third book now that's been published, but I have not yet had a chance to read that one. Uh, so I read these books initially... I think 10 years ago, 2004, 2005, somewhere in there. Uh, didn't remember a whole lot about them, so it's been uh, quite enjoyable to listen to them over the last couple months and kind of one of the fun things uh, to do with audiobooks that I enjoy anyway when I, I reread stuff through audiobook is to maybe try and find something that's been a long time since I've read. Uh, that I don't remember a lot, and then it almost feels like a brand new experience again. And, and this is this was very much like that for me. Uh, certainly, there were a lot of details I did remember, and more that came back to me as I listened. But uh, specific characters, specific plot arcs, all of that had kind of slipped my mind in the last decade or so since I read these. So it was fun to go back and uh, re-listen to them. Now, when I originally read them way back when. Uh, what I recall, I would have to go into my Goodreads account and check what star ratings I gave them originally. I think I gave them both five star ratings. Um, in other words, I really enjoyed them quite a bit, but I'm not, not quite sure on that. Four or five, somewhere in there. Uh, so you guys can all go double check me and I'll, I should have checked before I started this video, but I'll check afterwards instead just for my own intellectual satisfaction. Uh, but I enjoyed them quite a bit. I enjoyed A Deepness in the Sky, which is the second book and the prequel, more than A Fire Upon the Deep uh, when I initially read them. And that was the case again this time, and I'll get into some of the reasons why that was uh, in just a minute. Uh, but certainly enjoyed these the first time around. Enjoyed them a lot uh, this time around as well. I will say that even though I said I think I gave them both five star ratings initially, I'm not going to give them five star ratings this time. Not because I like them any less, but probably just more because my criteria has become a bit more stringent in the last 10 years, especially since Matt and I started doing the Sci-Fi Christian. It's, you know, one thing to just have a Goodreads account and just record your rating of something as you read it, and it's entirely something else to actually be doing a podcast, or in this case, a YouTube video, and have to actually give thought into, well, why is this a five-star book? So neither of these is going to get five stars, uh, which is in contradiction to what is in my Goodreads account, um, but that doesn't mean that I like them any less this time. It just means that I've changed in terms of my criteria for what I consider to be a five-star novel. Okay, so before I get to the plot of these books themselves, and again with rereads, just like I did for my George R. R. Martin or a Game of Thrones uh, review from yesterday, uh, I'm not going to necessarily do a full review of every aspect, more just kind of hit on the parts that hit me um, through the reread. That's kind of how I'm going to handle rereads uh, on these reviews. Crap, stupid mosquito. This is summer in Minnesota, and so if I randomly have to bend down because some stupid bug just bit me, that's why. I just killed one, so that's exciting. Uh, but yeah, we just get buried with them here in Minnesota summer, so that is part of the deal. So, a little time out there for you, just to explain my sudden burst of pain there as I started to get blood sucked out of my leg. Anyway, it was kind of interesting doing this review and thinking about these books back to back with doing the review of A Game of Thrones because it has caused me to kind of think about the relationship between fantasy and science fiction, which of course are always shelved together in bookstores. They're kind of taken as one and the same, I mean, we and Matt and I with the Sci-Fi Christian are guilty of that as well. 
uh, for better or worse. You know, we call ourselves the sci-fi Christian, but really, I mean, we do a lot of fantasy. You know, our Game of Thrones reviews, which are not sci-fi at all, are... Uh, probably the biggest thing we've ever done with the sh with the podcast and uh, with our brand in general. So we view sci-fi more as kind of a general overarching brand to mean that we cover everything within genre fiction, whether it's science fiction, you know, hard science fiction, soft science fiction, uh, fantasy, superheroes, you name it. You know, anything that would kind of fall under that umbrella, we cover with the uh, sci-fi label. And I think that that's pretty common, or to do with the sci-fi fantasy label, or, you know, some combination of the two. Uh, but thinking about these books, uh, uh, reading Game of Thrones and doing that review yesterday, and then doing the Werner Vinci reviews today, it made me feel uh, and kind of think that that's a bit of a huge <laughs> oversimplification when you think of it that fantasy and science fiction do have this intersection where they both stoke your imagination, right? I mean, if you sit down to read, you know, a Tom Clancy thriller or whatever, it's set in America, you know, you understand the history and everything, so your focus is going to be on the plot, the characters, you know, the technology, whatever he's... Uh, describing in any, any given novel, but it's set in this world. Uh, whereas a fantasy world is going to be somewhere that you have to figure out. Even if it's a variation on our world, you know, whether it's alternate history, you have to kind of figure it out. It makes you work to understand the world that it's set in. And science fiction certainly does the same thing. Superhero novels or superhero comics and movies to a certain degree make you do the same thing. Um, especially as they progress in their continuity. So that's kind of the intersection, and at that point it's valid, but everything beyond that isn't that valid. I think that fantasy has, uh, to me, good fantasy at least. You know, let's not talk the crap Dragonlance series or whatever. I apologize to any Dragonlance uh, fans I just offended, but your series deserves it. Uh, but, you know, you take Tolkien, you take Martin, you take... Uh, I was going to say Robert Jordan, but no, <laughs> I'm sorry. For as much of a Wheel of Time fan as I am, probably not. So, I mean, you take the good stuff, and it's going to have that quality of making you think about human nature, which I think George R. R. Martin certainly does, uh, make you think about culture and history and you know, society. Again, Martin does that, or make you think about the big philosophical questions of good versus evil, our place in the world, industrialization, which Tolkien certainly does a great job of all of those. It's making you think about the human dilemma. Where I think science fiction goes, though, is that the human element is often much smaller, not always, but often, and instead what science fiction makes you think of is possibilities. What could the future be like if this happened? What would it be like if aliens showed up on our doorstep tomorrow? You know, what would it be like if, in the case of Werner Vinci stuff, we're thousands upon thousands of years in the future and we're all of a sudden discovering new things about the universe and all that? And to me, that is the mark of a good science fiction novel is that it makes you think about the future, it makes you think about ideas, technical ideas, tech, uh, futuristic ideas, uh, futuristic society ideas, all of that stuff, it makes you think about the world you live in in a different way and what it could be when we eventually reach the point as humans where we can explore the galaxy and everything. And Werner Vinge's two books here do a phenomenal job of being that type of science fiction. So in A Fire Upon the Deep, which is the first one, we get introduced to a world where the physics vary depending on the part of the universe that you're in, hence the Zones of Thought moniker that gets uh, attached to these two books. So there's a zone called the slowness where only very few things are possible and then as you go into the beyond you get to the point where you can do faster than light travel and some other things like that and then eventually there's the transcend at the end of the high beyond where basically uh, to misquote or, uh, Arthur C. Clarke everything is just uh, indistinguishable from magic. Uh, so you get this kind of dynamic that makes you think about 
what would it be like to live in that world? And to me, I really dig that because to me that has been, even though I'm not a very scientifically minded person, that's been one of the more interesting scientific ideas that I've ever encountered. I remember being in, I was an English major in college, and I was in, a, I had to take an astronomy class because I was a liberal arts major and, you know, you got to have your requisite science class or two. So I was in an astronomy class. And I remember just a throwaway line that the uh, professor had one oh, in one of his lectures where he's saying, well, you know, we th as far as we know, physics are the same everywhere in the universe, but that might not be true. You know, we could potentially find out that that's not true. And that's one of the only things that actually has stuck with me from that class over 10 years later. Because uh, that, to me, just blew my mind when I heard that. But what would it be like to get to another part of the galaxy where the universe, where stuff works differently, where the laws of physics aren't the same. And Werner Vinci does a great job of exploring what that's like. Uh, he also does a great job of introducing us to uh, alien races in both these books, The Tines and Fire Upon the Deep, and The Spiders and the Deepness in the Sky, and makes us uh, kind of look at these alien races who seem very human-like, except for when they're not. You know, the times we get a pack race where every individual isn't an individual body, but they have, you know, three, four dog-like creatures who all function as one individual. And again, it makes you think about, okay, we imagine aliens as, you know, little green men or, you know, greys or whatever. But what would it be, what would it be like if dogs evolved uh, in the way that humans did? What would it be like if spiders evolved in the way that humans did? And again, uh, Vernovici just knocks that out of the park in terms of making you think about uh, the possibilities of encountering that type of alien life. Not aliens who are just like us, except with bigger heads and really skinny or whatever, but uh, let's t push it one step farther. What would it be like if we got this type of alien? And to me, that's brilliant. That's what science fiction should do. It should challenge your ideas of what would it be like to encounter alien life. It should challenge your ideas of what's actually out there in the universe and make you think about them in new ways. Uh, and these two books are brilliant at that. Now, in terms of critiques on the first book, Fire Upon the Deep, I do have to say that plot-wise, there's a solid plot there. The characters are mostly good. Uh, my biggest critique of it is that it slows down way, way, way down in the middle, uh, and the plot kind of comes to a screeching halt for quite a while. There's a couple characters who are a little bit annoying, though I could blame that on the audiobook narrator, uh, who I think his name was Peter Larkin. He's mostly really good, but there are a few characters, uh, especially in Fire Upon the Deep, where the voices he does for them are just grating. Uh, they're super, super annoying. So um, that kind of took away from the experience for me a little bit. So in terms of ideas, Fire Upon the Deep, brilliant. Absolutely five stars from that perspective. Characters, plot, a little bit lower. So I'm going to give Fire Upon the Deep uh, three and a half stars, but a very optimistic and high three and a half stars. Um, certainly I would round that up to four if I, w if I had to, uh, which I would have to do if I was going to rewrite this on Goodreads, but I'll probably just leave my original rating as it is. The Deepness in the Sky is kind of interesting by comparison because it repeats a lot of the same character and plot and even ideas from A Fire Upon the Deep, but it does them all better. So the tines are really interesting, the dog-like race in A Fire Upon the Deep, uh, but the spiders are even more interesting in A Deepness in the Sky. We get some characters who are very similar. Mr. Steel uh, in Fire Upon the Deep is very similar to Richard Rugal. Uh, Flenser is very similar to Tomas Now. But the characters, uh, the Fire Upon, or the Deepness in the Sky version, are much more compelling. And in addition, at least to me, I never felt the same type of slowdown in the plot as I did in A Deepness in the Sky. Uh, it's also fascinating that Deepness in the Sky is set quite a bit earlier. I'm not going to take a guess as to how much because the series is vast in terms of its years. I think it's set 8,000 years in our future, but um, 
quite a few millennia even before Fire Upon the Deep. So it's an interesting prequel that way. Uh, I would recommend reading Fire Upon the Deep first if you're going to read them both. Uh, you don't have to. I just think that there's a couple things, especially in terms of the one character, who I won't say who it is, who overlaps in two books, or in both the books. I think you'll get more out of it if you read Fire Upon the Deep first. So go in the publication order, not the chronological order, would be my recommendation. Uh, but getting back to the second book, uh, to me it just perfects what Vinji did in the initial book. I really enjoyed the plot more, I enjoyed the characters more, I enjoyed the tension between uh, the Chang Ho and the Emergent Fleet, which I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce Chang Ho, but that's how the audiobook pronouncer, or reader pronounced it, so that's what I'm going with. Um, there is, in terms of ideas beyond just the scientific stuff, um, Vinji is a pretty ardent libertarian, from my understanding, and that comes out more pronounced in Deepness in the Sky, but it's never preachy in an Ayn Rand type of way. It rather, it just makes you, again, think. It's not the big idea of the novel, so, you know, if you're not a libertarian, which, even though I have some sympathies in that direction, I certainly would not count myself as a libertarian, uh, if for no other reason that I simply can't reconcile libertarian ideas with my Catholic faith and with Catholic social teaching. Uh, but all that aside, uh, I don't think that that should be distracting for anyone, whether you're on board or, you know, think libertarianism is the worst thing to ever exist in our world. But uh, I, I thought it was interesting the way that he kind of brought in some of those elements and did a good job with introducing them in a way that certainly comes across, uh, his point of view certainly comes across, but it's never preachy, it's never distracting from the story, and in fact really adds to some of the dynamics that he's exploring in the whole tension between those two groups throughout the novel. So really, really enjoyed this one. In fact, I would give this one four and a half stars. Uh, so still not quite up at the five that I think I rated it before, but really, really good. This is near perfect science fiction. Um, what keeps it from being a five? Well, you know, for as much as I said that science fiction is about the introduction of, of ideas, not about characters, you know, the characters are not the most complex in the world. And while that's not a huge deal since it's not the center point of the novel, I think if you're going to get to that level of being a five-star perfect book, uh, you've got to do better than just passable or even good characters. You have to have great characters, and that's maybe where this novel falters just a little bit. So I am aware that there was just published a follow-up to Fire Upon the Deep called Children in the Sky, I want to say. I might be wrong on the title, but he does have a third book out. Uh, I am going to check that out because I really enjoyed this reread so much, though I am disappointed that it's a sequel to Fire Upon the Deep, not Deepness in the Sky, not only because I like the second book better, but because I think that it left so much more open in terms of possibilities for a sequel. But who knows, maybe he'll come back to uh, Deepness in the Sky at some point in his career. So both books, highly recommend. If you like science fiction, you're going to enjoy both of these. Uh, Fire Upon the Deep is considered one of the classics in the genre, so if you haven't read it and you're a fan of sci-fi novels, you owe it to yourself to at least check it out. Uh, I enjoyed them both. Enjoyed the audiobook. Uh, outside of a few of the voices I mentioned, I would recommend that format as well. But whether you're reading it or listening to it, I think you're really going to enjoy these if you decide to check them out. So, that's all for now. I'm Ben DiBono, and this is the Sci-Fi Christian Book Reviews. Goodbye. <laughs>